In the month of November 1811, my husband Hyoka II, who had been sick four years of the consumption, died at the advanced age of 103 years, as nearly as the time could be estimated. He was the last that remained to me of our family connection, or rather of my old friends with whom I was adopted, except a part of one family which now lives at Tonawanta. Hyoka II was buried decently, and had all the insignia of a veteran warrior buried with him, consisting of a war club, tomahawk and scalping knife, a powder flask, flint, a piece of spunk, a small cake and a cup, and in his best clothing. Hyoka II was an old man when I first saw him, but he was by no means enervated. During the term of nearly fifty years that I lived with him, I received, according to Indian customs, all the kindness and attention that was my due as his wife. Although war was his trade from his youth till old age and decrepitude stopped his career, he uniformly treated me with tenderness and never offered an insult. I have frequently heard him repeat the history of his life from his childhood, and when he came to that part which related to his actions, his bravery and his valour in war. When he spoke of the ambush, the combat, the spoiling of his enemies and the sacrifice of the victims, his nerves seemed strung with youthful ardour. The warmth of the able warrior seemed to animate his frame, and to produce the heated gestures which he had practised in middle age. He was a man of tender feelings to his friends, ready and willing to assist them in distress. Yet as a warrior, his cruelties to his enemies perhaps were unparalleled, and will not admit a word of palliation. Kyokatu was born in one of the tribes of the Six Nations that inhabited the banks of the Susquehanna, or rather he belonged to a tribe of the Senecas that made, at the time of the Great Indian Treaty, a part of those nations. He was own cousin to Farmer's brother, a chief who has been justly celebrated for his worth. Their mothers were sisters, and it was through the influence of Farmer's brother that I became Hyokatu's wife. In early life, Hyokatu showed signs of thirst for blood by attending only to the art of war, in the use of the tomahawk and scalping knife, and in practicing cruelties upon everything that chanced to fall into his hands, which was susceptible of pain. In that way he learned to use his implements of war effectually, and at the same time blunted all those fine feelings and tender sympathies that are naturally excited by hearing or seeing a fellow being in distress. He could inflict the most excruciating tortures upon his enemies, and prided himself upon his fortitude in having performed the most barbarous ceremonies and tortures without the least degree of pity or remorse. Thus qualified, when very young he was initiated into scenes of carnage by being engaged in the wars that prevailed amongst the Indian tribes. In the year 1731, he was appointed a runner to assist in collecting an army to go against the Kotaupis, Cherokees and other southern Indians. A large army was collected, and after a long and fatiguing march, met its enemies in what was then called the Low, Dark and Bloody Lands, near the mouth of Red River, in what is now called the State of Kentucky. The Kotalpis and their associates had by some means been apprised of their approach, and lay in ambush to take them at once, when they should come within their reach and destroy the whole army. The northern Indians, with their usual sagacity, discovered the situation of their enemies, rushed upon the ambuscade, and massacred twelve hundred on the spot. The battle continued for two days and two nights, with the utmost severity, in which the northern Indians were victorious, and so far succeeded in destroying the Cotalpes, that they at that time ceased to be a nation. The victors suffered an immense loss in killed, but gained the hunting ground which was their grand object, though the Cherokees would not give it up in a treaty or consent to make peace. Bows and arrows at that time were in general use, though a few guns were employed. From that time he was engaged in a number of battles in which Indians only were engaged, and that made fighting his business till the commencement of the French War. In those battles he took a number of Indians prisoners, whom he killed by tying them to trees and then setting small Indian boys to shooting at them with arrows, till death finished the misery of the sufferers, a process that frequently took two days for its completion. During the French War, he was in every battle that was fought on the Susquehanna and Ohio rivers, and was so fortunate as never to have been taken prisoner. At Braddock's defeat, he took two white prisoners and burnt them alive in a fire of his own kindling. In 1777, he was in the battle at Fort Freeland in Northumberland County, Penn. The fort contained a great number of women and children, and was defended only by a small garrison. The force that went against it consisted of 100 British regulars, commanded by a colonel, MacDonald and 300 Indians under Hyokatu. After a short but bloody engagement, the fort was surrendered. The women and children were sent under an escort to the next fort below, 
and the men and boys taken off by a party of British to the general Indian encampment. As soon as the fort had capitulated and the firing had ceased, Hyokatu, with the help of a few Indians, tomahawked every wounded American while earnestly begging with uplifted hands for quarters. The massacre was but just finished when capts. Dowerty and Boone arrived with a reinforcement to assist the garrison. On their arriving in sight of the fort, they saw that it had surrendered and that an Indian was holding the flag. This so much inflamed Captain Dougherty that he left his command, stepped forward and shot the Indian at the first fire. Another took the flag and had no sooner got it erected than Dougherty dropped him as he had the first. A third presumed to hold it, who was also shot down by Dougherty. Hiokatu, exasperated at the sight of such bravery, sallied out with a party of his Indians and killed Caps, Dougherty, Boone and fourteen men, at the first fire. The remainder of the two companies escaped by taking to flight and soon arrived at the fort which they had left but a few hours before. In an expedition that went out against Cherry Valley and the neighbouring settlements, Captain David, a Mohawk Indian, was first and Hyokatu the second in command. The force consisted of several hundred Indians who were determined on mischief and the destruction of the whites. A continued series of wantonness and barbarity characterised their career, for they plundered and burnt everything that came in their way, and killed a number of persons, among whom were several infants, whom Hyokatu butchered or dashed upon the stones with his own hands. Besides the instances which have been mentioned, he was in a number of parties during the Revolutionary War, where he ever acted a conspicuous part. The Indians, having removed the seat of their depredations and war to the frontiers of Pennsylvania, Ohio, Kentucky and the neighbouring territories, assembled a large force at Upper Sandusky, their place of general rendezvous, from whence they went out to the various places which they designed to sacrifice. Tired of the desolating scenes that were so often witnessed, and feeling a confidence that the savages might be subdued and an end put to their crimes, the American government raised a regiment consisting of 300 volunteers for the purpose of dislodging them from their cantonment and preventing further barbarities. Colonel William Crawford and Levin Colonel David Williamson, men who had been thoroughly tried and approved, were commissioned by General Washington to take the command of a service that seemed all important to the welfare of the country. In the month of July 1782, well armed and provided with a sufficient quantity of provision, this regiment made an expeditious march through the wilderness to Upper Sandusky, where, as had been anticipated, they found the Indians assembled in full force at their encampment, prepared to receive an attack. As Colonel Crawford and his brave band advanced, and when they had got within a short distance from the town, they were met by a white man with a flag of truce from the Indians, who proposed to Colonel Crawford that if he would surrender himself and his men to the Indians, their lives should be spared, but that if they persisted in their undertaking and attacked the town, they should all be massacred to a man. Crawford, while hearing the proposition, attentively surveyed its bearer, and recognised in his features one of his former schoolmates and companions, with whom he was perfectly acquainted, by the name of Simon Gertie. Gertie, but a short time before this, had been a soldier in the American army, in the same regiment with Crawford, but on the account of his not having received the promotion that he expected, he became disaffected, swore an eternal war with his countrymen, fled to the Indians, and joined them, as a leader well qualified to conduct them to where they could satiate their thirst for blood, upon the innocent, unoffending and defenceless settlers. Crawford sternly inquired of the traitor if his name was not Simon Gertie, and being answered in the affirmative, he informed him that he despised the offer which he had made and that he would not surrender his army unless he should be compelled to do so, by a superior force. Gertie returned and Crawford immediately commenced an engagement that lasted till night, without the appearance of victory on either side, when the firing ceased, and the combatants on both sides retired to take refreshment and to rest through the night. Crawford encamped in the woods near half a mile from the town, where, after the sentinels were placed, and each had taken his ration, they slept on their arms, that they might be instantly ready in case they should be attacked. The stillness of death hovered over the little army, and sleep relieved the whole, except the wakeful sentinels who vigilantly attended to their duty. But what was their surprise, when they found late in the night, that they were surrounded by the Indians on every side, except a narrow space between them and the town? Every man was under arms, and the officers instantly consulted each other on the best method of escaping, for they saw that to fight would be useless, and that to surrender would be death. 
Crawford proposed a retreat through the ranks of the enemy in an opposite direction from the town, as being the most sure course to take. Lieutenant Colonel Williamson advised to march directly through the town, where there appeared to be no Indians, and the fires were yet burning. There was no time or place for debates. Colonel Crawford, with sixty followers, retreated on the route that he had proposed by attempting to rush through the enemy, but they had no sooner got amongst the Indians than every man was killed or taken prisoner. Amongst the prisoners were Colonel Crawford and Dr. Knight, surgeon of the regiment. Lieutenant Colonel Williamson, with the remainder of the regiment together with the wounded, set out at the same time that Crawford did, went through the town without losing a man, and by the help of good guides arrived at their homes in safety. The next day after the engagement, the Indians disposed of all their prisoners to the different tribes, except Colonel Crawford and Dr. Knight, but those unfortunate men were reserved for a more cruel destiny. A council was immediately held on Sandusky Plains, consisting of all the chiefs and warriors, ranged in their customary order, in a circular form, and Crawford and Knight were brought forward and seated in the centre of the circle. The council being opened, the chiefs began to examine Crawford on various subjects relative to the war. At length they inquired who conducted the military operations of the American army on the Ohio and Susquehanna rivers during the year before and who had led that army against them with so much skill and so uniform success. Crawford very honestly, and without suspecting any harm from his reply, promptly answered that he was the man who had led his countrymen to victory, who had driven the enemy from the settlements, and by that means had procured a great degree of happiness to many of his fellow citizens. Upon hearing this, a chief who had lost a son in the year before, in a battle where Colonel Crawford commanded, left his station in the council, stepped to Crawford, blacked his face, and at the same time told him that the next day he should be burnt. The council was immediately dissolved on its hearing the sentence from the chief, and the prisoners were taken off the ground and kept in custody through the night. Crawford now viewed his fate as sealed, and despairing of ever returning to his home or his country, only dreaded the tediousness of death, as commonly inflicted by the savages, and earnestly hoped that he might be dispatched at a single blow. Early the next morning, the Indians assembled at the place of execution, and Crawford was led to the post, the goal of savage torture to which he was fastened. The post was a stick of timber placed firmly in the ground, having an arm framed in at the top, and extending some six or eight feet from it, like the arm of a signpost. A pile of wood containing about two cords lay a few feet from the place where he stood, which he was informed was to be kindled into a fire that would burn him alive, as many had been burnt on the same spot, who had been much less deserving than himself. Gertie stood and supposedly looked on the preparations that were making for the funeral of one of his former playmates, a hero by whose side he had fought, of a man whose valour had won laurels which, if he could have returned, would have been strewed upon his grave by his grateful countrymen. Dreading the agony that he saw he was about to feel, Crawford used every argument which his perilous situation could suggest to prevail upon Gertie to ransom him at any price and deliver him as it was in his power, from the savages and their torments. Gertie heard his prayers and expostulations, and saw his tears with indifference, and finally told the forsaken victim that he would not procure him a moment's respite, nor afford him the most trifling assistance. The colonel was then bound, stripped naked, and tied by his wrists to the arm, which extended horizontally from the post, in such a manner that his arms were extended over his head, with his feet just standing upon the ground, this being done, the savages placed the wood in a circle around him, at the distance of a few feet, in order that his misery might be protracted to the greatest length, and then kindled it in a number of places at the same time. The flames arose and the scorching heat became almost insupportable. Again he prayed to Gertie in all the anguish of his torment, to rescue him from the fire or shoot him dead upon the spot. A demoniac smile suffused the countenance of Gertie, while he calmly replied to the dying suppliant that he had no pity for his sufferings, but that he was then satisfying that spirit of revenge, which for a long time he had hoped to have an opportunity to wreak upon him. Nature now almost exhausted from the intensity of the heat, he settled down a little, when a squaw threw coals of fire and embers upon him, which made him groan most piteously, while the whole camp rung with exultation. During the execution they manifested all the ecstasy of a complete triumph, Poor Crawford soon died and was entirely consumed. Thus ended the life of a patriot and hero who had been intimate with General Washington 
and who shared in an eminent degree the confidence of that great good man, to whom, in the time of revolutionary perils, the sons of legitimate freedom looked with a degree of faith in his mental resources, unequalled in the history of the world. That tragedy being ended, Dr. Knight was informed that on the next day he should be burnt in the same manner that his comrade Crawford had been at Lower Sandusky. Hayoka too, who out had been a leading chief in the battle with, and in the execution of Crawford, painted Doctor, Knight's face black, and then bound and gave him up to two able-bodied Indians to conduct to the place of execution. They set off with him immediately, and travelled till towards evening, when they halted to encamp till morning. The afternoon had been very rainy, and the storm still continued, which rendered it very difficult for the Indians to kindle a fire. Knight, observing the difficulty under which they laboured, made them to understand by signs that if they would unbind him, he would assist them. They accordingly unbound him, and he soon succeeded in making a fire by the application of small dry stuff, which he was at considerable trouble to procure. While the Indians were warming themselves, the docked continued to gather wood to last through the night, and in doing this, he found a club which he placed in a situation from whence he could take it conveniently whenever an opportunity should present itself, in which he could use it effectually. The Indians continued warming, till at length the docked saw that they had placed themselves in a favourable position for the execution of his design, when, stimulated by the love of life, he cautiously took his club and at two blows knocked them both down. Determined to finish the work of death which he had so well begun, he drew one of their scalping knives, with which he beheaded and scalped them both. He then took a rifle, tomahawk and some ammunition, and directed his course for home, where he arrived without having experienced any difficulty on his journey. The next morning the Indians took the track of their victim and his attendants, to go to Lower Sandusky, and there execute the sentence which they had pronounced upon him. But what was their surprise and disappointment, when they arrived at the place of encampment, where they found their trusty friends scalped and decapitated, and that their prisoner had made his escape? Chagrined beyond measure, they immediately separated, and went in every direction in pursuit of their prey. But after having spent a number of days unsuccessfully, they gave up the chase and returned to their encampment. In the time of the French War, in an engagement that took place on the Ohio River, Hyokutu took a British colonel by the name of Simon Canton, whom he carried to the Indian encampment. A council was held, and the colonel was sentenced to suffer death by being tied on a wild colt with his face towards its tail, and then having the colt turned loose to run where it pleased. He was accordingly tied on, and the colt let loose, agreeable to the sentence. The colt run two days, and then returned with its rider yet alive. The Indians, thinking that he would never die in that way, took him off, and made him run the gauntlet three times. But in the last race a squaw knocked him down, and he was supposed to have been dead. He, however, recovered, and was sold for fifty dollars to a Frenchman, who sent him as a prisoner to Detroit. On the return of the Frenchman to Detroit, the colonel besought him to ransom him, and give or set him at liberty, with so much warmth and promised with so much solemnity, to reward him as one of the best of benefactors, if he would let him go, that the Frenchman took his word, and sent him home to his family. The colonel remembered his promise, and in a short time sent his deliverer one hundred and fifty dollars as a reward for his generosity. Since the commencement of the Revolutionary War, Hyokatu has been in seventeen campaigns, four of which were in the Cherokee War. He was so great an enemy to the Cherokees, and so fully determined upon their subjugation, that on his march to their country he raised his own army for those four campaigns and commanded it, and also superintended its subsistence. In one of those campaigns, which continued two whole years without intermission, he attacked his enemies on the mobile, drove them to the country of the Creek Nation, where he continued to harass them, till being tired of war he returned to his family. He brought home a great number of scalps, which he had taken from the enemy, and ever seemed to possess an unconquerable will that the Cherokees might be utterly destroyed. Towards the close of his last fighting in that country he took two squaws, whom he sold on his way home for money to defray the expense of his journey. Hyokatu was about six feet four or five inches high, large-boned and rather inclined to leanness. He was very stout and active, for a man of his size, for it was said by himself and others, that he had never found an Indian who could keep up with him on a race or throw him at wrestling. His eye was quick and penetrating, and his voice was of that harsh and powerful kind which, amongst Indians, always commands attention.
His health had been uniformly good. He never was confined by sickness till he was attacked with the consumption four years before his death. And although he had, from his earliest days, been inured to almost constant fatigue and exposure to every inclemency of the weather, in the open air he seemed to lose the vigour of the prime of life only by the natural decay occasioned by old age.